When I talk about cloning, the first thing that comes to mind for most people is not the molecular cloning I will spend this video talking about. It is cloning of organisms, of animals, of people, and the most famous example that we know of is Dolly, the first mammal cloned from a cell taken from an adult. And this happened in the Roslin Institute in Scotland in 1996. And of course, Dolly looked like a sheep, barred like a sheep. It was a technical marvel. And everyone thought this was going to be the next wave of innovation. We all thought by now there would be a very clear cure for cancer, multiple clones for all of us. But 20 years later down the track, we're still not there yet, despite incredible advances in technology that scientists are using. And therein lies the central challenge in discussing this type of content. Laboratory techniques and scientific skills are all amazingly powerful, but biology is messy complicated and much less predictable than other STEM disciplines like physics, maths, and chemistry. And as molecular biologists, all we can do is control the controllables, focusing on the process, not the end results. Hello, my name is Jack Wayne. I'm a science educator and microbiologist based in Australia. And today we're gonna to be talking about molecular cloning in particular, one of the ways that we can streamline this process, colony PCR. What we're trying to do in molecular cloning is to put multiple pieces of DNA that didn't originally belong together into one single piece of DNA. And the most common way that we do this is we take a DNA sequence of a particular gene of interest or GOI, and we try and fuse it with a circular plasmid that has a lot of great features we can take advantage of. It can be controlled. We can make a lot of the protein or not much of the protein. And all of a sudden that gene of interest is a lot more useful to us because we can characterize what it does inside living cells. And the first step has to be identifying the sequence of the gene of interest. And thanks to the Human Genome Project and many sequencing projects that have happened since, any gene that you can think of, you can pretty much find the DNA sequence of it pretty quickly. And the first step into fusing these pieces of DNA together is you have to be able to isolate the DNA sequence of your gene of interest. And the way that we do this is classic PCR. We have a whole video dedicated to PCR that's linked down below. Your PCR product is not just the gene of interest sequence alone. When we design primers, we have to have additional sections of DNA, restriction enzyme sites. Restriction enzymes are able to recognize specific consensus sequences in DNA and cut it. And often this results in what we call a sticky end, where one strand of the DNA is a bit longer than the other strand of DNA, so it's an overhang. And these sticky end overhangs, the name kind of implies, will allow it to stick to another piece of DNA. DNA that has a mirror image of that particular DNA sequence. We cut the PCR product of your gene of interest with restriction enzymes. And we also cut the plasmid DNA that's circular. We also cut that with the same restriction enzymes. And all of a sudden there'll be sticking ends mirroring each other on your PCR product as well as your plasmid. Normally we don't cut the plasmid in random places. We cut it at a very specific site called the multiple cloning site or the MCS. We cut the PCR product and the plasmid, not just with one restriction enzyme, but with two different restriction enzymes, one for the forward part of the gene and one for the end part of the gene. And that way there is directionality built into this cloning process. The restriction sites for these enzymes, they are built into not the sequence of your gene of interest, but into the PCR primers. So when you amplify your gene using these PCR primers, there'll be part of the primer that matches your gene of interest. And there'll be another bit on the end that has an extension containing your restriction enzyme binding or cut site. So we've cut both the PCR product and the plasma now with two different restriction enzymes so that it will insert and these sticky ends allow them to bind to each other. But this binding is usually non-covalent, it's hydrogen bonding, so it's not very robust. And what we need to do to complete the circle is to run what we call a ligation reaction. And this forms covalent phosphodiester bonds between the PCR product DNA in your gene of interest and the circular plasmid. And now your gene of interest is embedded into this plasmid and we can use this plasmid to insert it into different cells and allow it to express into protein. There's many other features to the plasmid we can take advantage of, notably the antibiotic resistance gene. Only a cell that's expressing this plasmid will express the antibiotic resistance gene into protein and we can do a classic transformation. We've talked about transformation in detail in a previous video. At this point, you will have transformed bacterial cells. You take that transformed cell and you try and see what DNA is inside. Because what you want is that circular plasmid with a gene of interest. A bacterial cell surviving in that antibiotic does not mean it automatically contains 
your gene of interest is inserted into the plasmid. Lots of things can go wrong. The plasmid was not digested and linearized to begin with, so there's a lot of circular plasmid left over in your mix. Or the bacteria that you used in the transformation was contaminated or naturally resistant to the antibiotic and it doesn't have the DNA inside it at all. We do have to check the DNA from your transformed bacterial cell to be sure. And the gold standard is to send it away for DNA sequencing and check base by base if it's your gene of interest. You might need to screen hundreds of colonies, not just one. So that's a really expensive use of your time and resources. Hence, we get to the crux of the technique we're actually talking about today, which is colony PCR. It's a quick way to get around this. You don't have to purify the DNA from the bacterial colony. You can run a very quick PCR reaction from the colony directly, hence colony PCR. And once you check that it passes this first round of testing, then you only cherry pick the ones to send away for sequencing. You only do the follow-up steps for a smaller number of candidates hence saving your time. Now, colony PCR is at its heart a PCR reaction. You would have seen the setup of a PCR reaction and all the ingredients involved in our previous video on PCR. Here are a list of reagents. There's usually some kind of buffer. There are DNTPs, there's forward and reverse primer, and there's also a polymerase enzyme designed to amplify the reaction plus nuclease free water. So I'll give you a second to work out the volumes for both one single 20 microliter reaction, as well as the master mix. Pause the video here if you wanna have a go at it yourself. You can see now the answers are on screen for each of these calculated values. The PCR primers in the colony PCR reaction are targeting the beginning and the end of the multiple cloning side of the plasmid. Now, this is going to be a very small stretch of DNA if there is no gene inserted inside the multiple cloning site. It's still some DNA, as you can see on screen, but it's not at all a big piece of DNA. But if there is a gene inserted, then all of a sudden what's amplified is gonna be a bigger piece of DNA. And we can run a geoelectrophoresis experiment and check the size of the bands. So let's talk to the protocol now. What we have is a plate with our transformed colonies growing on it, but we don't know which of those has our plasmid. And we make up the PCR master mix as we talked about before. And we have one extra reaction designed for our negative control, which is the undigested plasmid that should have no gene within its multiple cloning site. We first pick a colony from the plate using a pipette tip or a toothpick. And in these tubes, we have just some sterile water because what we ultimately want to do is to boil the colony to extract the DNA. You can see here that we subcultured the colony into a separate bottle or a tube or plate. And that just means we can go back to the culture later on. We put tubes into 100 degrees Celsius for about five minutes to boil the bacteria. You can also spin down any extracellular debris in a centrifuge if you would like. And what we have in these tubes are going to be the extracted genomic DNA from those colonies. Now you've got all the subculture broths, which we can incubate at 37 degrees Celsius. And we have our DNA that's been extracted and boiled. The next thing to do is to use this DNA as the template DNA in our PCR reactions. And you can see these four PCR reaction tubes, all of which have had the master mix that we prepared and calculated earlier. So we're adding a small amount of the genomic DNA that we bought from the bacterial colony into these PCR reaction tubes. Tubes one, two, and three correspond to three colonies that we're screening. And tube four, the final tube, corresponds to a negative control, a plasmid only control, which does not contain any insert within the plasmid. After setting up the PCR reactions, we load the samples into a PCR machine. And after the PCR reaction is finished, we load the samples into a gel and analyze the band sizes using gel electrophoresis. These are the results that we have from the gel. There are three lanes corresponding to the three colonies that we screened. And the last lane labeled P is our fourth sample or the negative control. You can see that there is a band present in the P lane and that's to be expected because the multiple cloning site with our primers designed against that site still will amplify a very small band of DNAs. When you compare it against these two lanes, so lane one, you have a band that's about the same size as what we see in a negative control lane. So we would say lane one is negative. That particular the colony does not contain a plasmid with the gene of interest. In contrast, sample three has a band as well, but it's higher up in the gel, which means it's bigger in size. And this should actually be the gene of interest, but it could also be another piece of DNA. So that's why we need to take it to the next stage, which is to be sequenced and have it go through DNA sequencing. But you can see straight away that we're not bothering to do that with all the other colonies that we screened, only in this one positive colony. So that saves a lot of time and effort, not to mention reagents.
Now, despite the power of these techniques, odds are our gene of interest is just not that interesting. And even if it's successfully cloned, maybe it doesn't play a significant functional role in the disease or process you're studying, or it could be one out of thousands of genes that you're screening. So if one doesn't work back to the drawing board, keeping on screening multiple, multiple genes, and we can spend a lot of time focusing on the end result. But as scientists, we can't focus on that. We have to focus on the process, getting it right. We have to treasure the process of going through and figuring things out from scratch. This is the Biolab Collective. My name is Jack Wayne, and I'll see you in the next video.